Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm so glad to see so many of you here, especially on an afternoon where we have, I think, at least two competing events, plausibly competing events. So this is really a great turnout. Um, I am, for those of you who don't know, William Mazzarella, Anthropology Department. And this uh, talk uh, by James Curry, talk performance by James Curry, is part of a series uh, that Lauren Ballant here and I have been putting together. Uh, the light motif of the series is something like affirmation and criticality. One of the key uh, terms that we sort of came up with early on was the notion of being at odds. Um, at odds as critical theorists, as performers, as, as writers, at odds with the world we're reflecting on, but perhaps also at odds with ourselves somehow in our relation to these processes of writing, thinking, performing. Um, at odds with the prospect of having a more affirmative relationship to the things we think critically about, or perhaps at odds with the sense of affirmation we feel in relation to critique. So all of these were sort of uh, ideas, inclinations, imp Im impulsions, I want to say, that were flying around when we were talking about this. Um, I wanted to introduce uh, James by uh, reflecting on my very first memory, actually, of James. Uh, which takes us back to, I think, the autumn of 1988. Um, I saw James uh, dancing at the uh, college disco. And um, even at that moment, he seemed to exhibit a kind of gravity-defying quality. Uh, he had this kind of floppy hair that was somehow flying of its own accord. I remember him wearing a horizontally striped top that seemed somehow to accentuate this sort of, um, uh, this hovering effect that, that he had achieved. Um, over, over time, uh, I got to know James and um, discovered that um, he was in fact much more serious about his work than most of the uh, very earnest rest of us. Um, he, he had gravity, we thought we had some kind of gravitas, um, and I think, um, he was much better at all this stuff than I ever was, and I learned a lot about him. Uh, I learned a lot from him and about him, but we'll get to that later. I learned a lot from him about the, uh, the unbearable lightness, but also the comedy of gravity. And I think it's really uh, those uh, characteristics that over the years he's brought to his work, both as a scholar, um, he's published loads of articles, and, and you can look them up. Most recently, he has a, a book that came out last year, uh, which he wanted to be called, and it was an excellent, excellent title. He wanted it to be called No Music, which um, apparently the press were too frightened to let him get away with. Uh, but it, so instead it's called uh, Music and the Politics of Negation, and I highly recommend it to all of you. Um, but James has also brought these qualities uh, to the work he's done as a librettist, as a poet, um, as a performer. Um, and uh, it gives me great personal and professional pleasure to give you today, James Curry. Um, thank you, William. That's incredibly touching. I never knew that. Um, I just never knew. Um, I also wanted to uh, thank you, um, those of you who are involved, for inviting me to come today. Um, it's always, one tends to find that one's either giving an academic paper, which I always feel becomes too performative and then becomes a problem, or giving a performance, which has its own kinds of issues. Um, but to actually be invited to an academic forum to give a performance lecture, and the, uh, the requirement was, or not requirement, but the suggestion was, please don't just give a normal paper. Um, so I thought I would, um, having read a lot of psychoanalysis, it's always a little bit tricky to do this, I thought I would take the demand seriously, um, and in fact do what I was asked to do. Um, so this is, I will be reading, um, but it is not, or only very partly, an academic paper. I've been sort of following um, slightly from a distance what's been going on in this series, and so I kind of set myself slightly in the spirit of the sort of an experimental tradition. I kind of set myself a um, sort of series of requirements that I had to follow. Um, one, the first one, was that I had to enjoy my writing. Um, 
and again, I thought about that perhaps in a quite literal psychoanalytic sense. Um, at each stage of the proceedings, I inverted the process that I would usually have if I was writing an academic paper. Um, so at each point in the proceedings, I insisted that I followed the demands that emerged from the ascetic form rather than the demands that emerged from the content. Um, as a result, it produces a particular um, kind of uh, beast. Um, I'm not going to say much more for the moment. I would in particular uh, like to thank Alex for all his remarkable organizational skills. I had all sorts of being a profoundly neurotic human being. I had all sorts of requirements about how I was to be got here in a gilded cage and not in the sky and on the ground and all sorts of things like that. And he, he never skipped a beat. And I was incredible, incredibly grateful for that and for the other people for inviting me. Um, so I will go straight in now because I like my theater and this is kind of a piece of theater. To, um, to be hysteric and fetishistic, and therefore I don't like to ruin its frame too much um, by giving it an exegesis before I begin. Um, so first of all, I would like to start with an aria. <clears throat> These days, everything's over before it's begun. We haven't even yet reached home before Apple, smiling, demands, return to the Apple store right now and be the first to get the new iPhone. That, of course, would be the iPhone that tells us that the iPhone that we have just purchased and are presently clasping in our clammy paws as we scuttle back towards our burrows is already old. So I guess if we all now live in an apple, then none of us will ever be getting home again. There just ain't enough time to get hold of their new products and to get home to enjoy them as well. And to be at home with the old is just gross. You might as well be home alone. What on earth would you do if somebody broke in? Who's going to protect you, eh? The old? Really, I'm telling you, if there's one conclusion worth taking home from all 40 seconds of this crap so far, it's that it's much safer if you don't go home. In fact, that is the conclusion of this whole thing, period. Don't go home. And you needn't look so miffed about it either. If you've been listening properly from the beginning, you would remember that I said that these days everything's over before it's begun. Did you think I didn't mean it? Did you think this was some kind of performance or something? If I get to my end before I've started, because my end is in my beginning, which, by the way, does not mean that I have my head stuck up my ass, well, that's because I'm an apple, and that's magnificently homeless and you, whilst you never leave home and are therefore but old fruit. I know, okay? It's all pretty embarrassing, right? Me having concluded before we'd even got going, none of us being able to get home. This must be the worst one night stand any of us have been on in a really long time. We're stranded, folks. The main event, it ain't never gonna turn up. And since it now seems that I'm really wasting your time, you might also kind of hate me as well. After all, you're all busy people. This is the academy scuttling in the shadows of neoliberalism. The intellectual functions need account here for their every moment with the stopwatch. This is no time for meaningless performative play. But if there is really nothing left to happen, what are we going to do whilst we wait for the next 50 minutes to be up? Is it worth having nothing to say? Me looking at you, you looking at me, both of us at last compelled to face with sober senses our real conditions of life, our relations with our kind. A somewhat shop-worn convention tells us that those who find themselves shipwrecked feel compelled to start fessing up. God knows why. Truth seems like the cruelest luxury when things go wrong. But nevertheless, in the name of truth, let me be honest. I kind of hate you too. In case you're wondering, I'm not unaware of what a disaster I'm making of our relationship so far. I'm grabbing at truth here and asking my question in a spirit of desperation, in other words, academically. Is it news that it turns out that I hate you? 
After all, the Q and A is but under an hour away, and we all know how frequently that event necessitates the instigation of divorce proceedings. Soon enough, we'll all be more than aware that we don't like each other. So why state the inevitable up front? Why this insistence on concluding before I've even begun? Why, when it's so obvious that we're already lost at sea, must I repeatedly keep bringing us all to an empty pool to drink? Avec le temps, avec le temps, bateau s'en va. On oublie le visage et l'on oublie le voir. Le que quand ça va plus, c'est pas la peine d'aller chercher plus loin. Faut laisser faire et c'est très bien. Avec le temps. L'autre qu'on adorait, qu'on cherchait sous la pluie, l'autre qu'on devinait, au de tout dans le cœur, entre les mots, entre les lignes sous le phare, dans ce moment maquillé qui s'en va faire sa nuit avec le temps. Avec le temps, avec le temps va tout se va. Même les plus chouettes souvenirs, ça t'a de ce que à la gare il fiche pas cool. Dans la rayon de la mort, le samedi soir, quand la tendresse se va tout se. Qui l'ont donné du vent et des bijoux pour qu'il en ne vende du sol pour quelques sous devant quoi on se tenait comme traîner les chiens avec le temps va tout va bien. Et là, 
dans ce sang floué par les années perdues. Alors vraiment, avec le temps, on a avec le temps, on a avec le At this precise moment, as I sit here in the soiled t-shirt I wear in bed, ashtray mouth from the night before, ibuprofen looking at me longingly like the dog I don't have when it needs a walk, Buffalo, New York staring in at the window and wondering why I don't take a leaf out of its own book, stop bothering and just slump back and enjoy the show. The show, of course, being late modernity, performing its final leap, falling off its tightrope, plummeting to its death. You know, that old chestnut. Or alternatively, at this precise moment, Another sleepless night, tear-drowned eyes, peering into the haughty indifference and absent depths of my MacBook Air, trying really hard not to imagine the tombstone response that this obsessive professional dance of death of mine will inspire across the frankly criminal lineup of your listening faces, hoping I'll be able to defy failure's gravity and keep this ship afloat. Or even just now, like now, when I finally come to my senses again and realize that I'm no longer at home three weeks ago with a hangover, fancying how you'll all like my paper, fantasizing how about how out of your depth in love you're gonna be with me, but in fact wide awake, right here, now, reading this thing and confronted with the full magnitude of the mess that I've made, which is that based on absolutely no evidence, I've made the claim that you hate me and to save myself from the abject shame of being caught out loving those who might not love me back, have therefore parried with the taught, well, I hate you too. Well, at this moment, and man, when moments move as fast as moments do these days, is it hard to keep on board or what? At this moment, well, if before we all fell into the empty pool of that sad, sad song, and if when I was beginning, I kept concluding before I'd even begun, well, that was simply because I'd hoped that finding that there was nothing to drink you might have danced instead. It's not like I wanted to drag you on stage or use your embarrassment as some kind of mask beneath which the failure of my own performance could find shelter from the storm. I did indeed hear the angel announced. I accepted the solitude of this invitation and the darkness of your eyes, fearing and hoping for my fall. It's just that if you'd danced, we could have loved each other for our dancing and saved ourselves the shame of finding ourselves impotent to love the pittance left over once the music stops. When we're all as lost in the mists as we are and our bearings have melted into air, even the ground will make us stumble. We ain't ever getting home. And so since only the spear that smote us can heal the wound, I'd hoped we could act with a little dignity and cancel out the shaking ground with some shaking of our own. Dance on the dancing, dance it to death, and in the air a floating go. But it's your addiction to autopsy that screws it all up. You have to crack the rib cage open, cut the strings, peer with content greedy eyes into the cavity of the puppet slumped. Why do you want to pull out all that nonsense from the once dancing void? Do you want me to ape fury? It won't work. You're trying to rob me of a whole load of junk I'd be more than happy to just throw away anyway. Love should be a distance, the kindest of indifferences. You've committed a proximity crime. You got too close. 
so I hate you. Don't you remember? Truth is the cruelest luxury when things go wrong. I told you that before. Why don't you listen to me? I stand on the corner of the street and tell it to you straight. Your faces glaze over. I get on stage and sing you a song. Your mind yearns for words. And yes, that was me singing back then. Remember, I'm the optimist here. I haven't yet got to the point of writing the whole thing off as a catastrophe and thus addressing you academically. A shoddy showman I may well be schlepping about with my carpet bag full of ham hysterics, dusty jokes, tattered wings of little use for flight. But if I keep insisting on filling this space with the filthy stench of those who won't get off stage, that is simply because I can't let it go. I want to make your ear erect. Jamais ce soir. Pas de trapèze le soir de pleine lune. Pas la dernière fois. La toute dernière fois. Je pense que je dois arrêter ce rêve. Fini le cirque. Fini. De nouveau. Le soir tombe dans ma tête. La peur. Peur de la mort. Pourquoi pas la mort? L'essentiel parfois, n'être rien que beau. Se regarder dans le miroir, c'est se regarder penser. Qu'est-ce que tu penses alors Je pense que j'ai bien encore le droit d'avoir peur, mais non plus d'en parler. Tu n'es toujours pas devenu aveugle, le cœur bat toujours. Et voilà, tu pleures. Tu voudrais pleurer comme une toute petite fille qui a un gros chagrin. Tu sais pourquoi tu pleures Pour qui Pas pour moi. Non, je sais plus. J'aimerais savoir. Je sais rien. J'ai un petit peu peur. C'est parti. C'est plus là. Ça va revenir. C'est pas grave.
Okay, it's time for a story. In the autumn of the year, sometime near the beginning of our new century, a writer finally died from the illness that he had been suffering from for over 10 years. In a dark turn that span out light, there was something oddly apt about his illness. To the writer, it seemed as if the indifference that a physical malady usually exhibited in relationship to the balancing act of his hopes and fears had transformed into something benignly attracted to his well-being, as if the illness were trying to keep him in the practice of his discipline. He was fighting to keep his balance, to retain the ability which had made him famous of defying the increasingly melancholic gravity of the world in which he found himself towards his end. His was a life that had been lived in exile. When he was but a child, his family had been forced to leave their land, which was volatile with the endless encores of its colonial history. They had moved to a large and labyrinthine city in another part of that vast and twitchy region. A study in bustling mayhem, their adopted home was perhaps a distracting enough place in which to forget whatever hurts and regrets there may have been. His father was wealthy from business and savvy enough to have his son educated in the ways of the colonizers. But our writer was naughty, was expelled from school, and eventually was packed off to another continent and other colonizers, where he then excelled. Royal with qualifications, he settled down in this land as a professor of literature at a prestigious university, and from lack of proper nourishment, the past began to fade. His success abroad was unremarkable enough to him that it felt like home. But as homes do, it developed an illness whose first symptom was an itch. Increment by increment, his thoughts about literature were finding their expression settling into an articulately loud ire. The cherished books that he had loved had now to prove themselves worthy of such love. They had to show their strength as fictions by facing up to the truths that had allowed them such a privilege in the first place. At this time in his life, he was not a demanding lover because he demanded his beloved's be ideals nor did he indulge in the cruel laughter of the cynic as he pulls the rug out from beneath the expression of higher aspirations. It was rather that he expected of his encounters simultaneously both their causes and their effects. He would challenge the high degree of concentration necessary for a book to sustain the compelling reality of its fiction by demanding that it concentrate on the compelling realities of its surrounding non-fictional worlds too. Asking so much, some simply felt that he would make what he loved too confused to keep its balance. In secret, the writer was frightened too. Gravity was terrifying to him. To think it was to become giddy with vertigo. And vertigo was the intoxication of the weak the addiction of those who had decided to give in rather than stand up. In these years in which his early and conventional success was starting to wander into disquiet, he would often wake in terror in the middle of the night. In his sleep, he would see himself stumbling drunk, falling down in the middle of the main square, wishing to be down, lower than down, down and dead, deader still. The awful truth which forced him to awaken in order to escape was that at such abject moments he was possessed by a vast and peaceful happiness in his dreams. Asleep, he was in love with the ground and desired to be consumed by it, buried alive. Awake, however, he was in exile and being in exile in a foreign country meant walking a tightrope high above the ground without the net afforded by the fluency of the familiar. As we know only too well, none of us is ever going to get home. It is best to keep our grounding thoughts at bay. The writer concentrated on his exile instead. Since we must take a draft of a poison in order to liberate ourselves from the tortures of its prison, exile was the medicine that he drank for his addictions. When consciousness of his condition swelled enough to form a wave, its breaking would often crash into the white fury of a galloping plane of writings in which the theme provided the heat necessary to boil the waters into foam. In his later years, it was from these waters that his illness drank too. 
He noted that most people died quickly from the kind of disease he had or got better. He, by contrast, simply continued to live with it, neither submitting nor getting well enough to return home to the capabilities of good health. He was banished from the normalities of his own exile because he was living with a disease that was similarly in exile itself, unable to return to its familiar modes of destruction. It was a telling indication of the comedy of his world that at his end, even his disease would be a friend. At times, it made him wonder if too much of a bad thing might not be wonderful. Indeed, a minimal increase in the repetition of one of our life's more potent light motifs allows us to start hearing how our lives are composed like music and so guided by a sense of beauty. We then see ourselves as a concern of form, not content. Our responsibilities we realize are being handed to us by our enjoyments rather than being just special effects of the contingent. An individual transforms a fortuity into a motive which then assumes a permanent place in the composition of that individual's life. Anna Karenina could have chosen another way to commit suicide, but the motive of death and the railway station, unforgettably bound in her mind with the birth of love, enticed her in her hour of despair with its dark aesthetic logic. If we compose our life, even in our distress, according to laws of beauty, it is right to condemn our authors when they insist on being blind to the coincidences that give musical form to the lives they describe. They're depriving their characters of not only a dimension of beauty, but I suspect of their dignity too. In our writer's case, all melodies seem to cadence onto exile, making his music conventional and strange at the same time. After all, cadences are music's punctuation, the means by which she tells us where we are within her realm. Exile, by contrast, has no realm at all and taunts its citizens with the embarrassment of being lost. When we no longer have a home, our music is sometimes the only place to live, and increasingly that is where our writer took up residence. So you will excuse my indulgence as the teller of this tale if I now dissolve my beloved character into the meaninglessness of a tune. The British Museum had lost its charm. It was not simply that the beauty of the things to be found there no longer had the ability to convince, although it is true that today the writer found them to be inarticulate. It was not even that he was outraged by the arrogance of the pillage from which the collection had initially been formed. More than anyone, he was conscious of the colonial nastiness that had allowed for the spectacle of this institution to exist. Something else, though, had got hold of him, and it was holding him low and down. A lonely pot squatted in its theatrically lit modernist glass prison. It had been swiped from the very land in which he had been born. It was midweek, February, London, a foggy day outside, meant that everyone seemed constantly to be disappearing into the mist. Vaguely conscious of the brittleness of his conceit, the writer looked at the completely empty room in which he now stood and wondered to where all the people might have disappeared. Had they gone home? He himself was visiting from abroad for a speaking engagement. He stared in at the little pot and it stared back. They were like an old couple that had known each other so long they turned each other to stone. They had nothing to say. Reflectively, the writer's gaze was as blank as the pots. Rain Mac over his arm, he wandered out into the grey study of Bloomsbury with its small clumps of tourists being herded like sheep into pub doorways by the periodic passing of officious students from University College. He felt safe, if lacking in direction. Lunch was in some falafel bar where he sat listening to the guys working their chat in Arabic in their cigarette and dark coffee dialect. Girlfriends, the rise in the price of petrol, news of a relative back home who died, where to send the kids to school, business, girls, business, a dream of how it could be, a happy enough weave of the wrenching and the quotidian. After the British Museum, though, it was nice to hear this language spoken for reasons of the mundane. 
Not without a certain tired irony, he went and visited some of his own books in the large university bookstore just off Gordon Square. They didn't make him proud like a parent would be of its children, but he was fond of them because they reminded him of where he'd been and what he'd been doing when he'd been working on them. And it was nice for a moment to think of the life that had been lived, even though now he was sick and surely must soon die. <laughs> What's the point? He thought. And he was embarrassed by the pitiful lack of sophistication exhibited by this conclusion to the afternoon's rather diluted set of thoughts. He had watched and commentated and participated as the land of his birth had messily fought for its independence. He had given his love of books over to his engagement, but something fundamental about his belief in the project had died. I will not live to see a happy end to this, he thought. And indeed he did not. Exile remained his friend. For no better reason than for the fact of doing it, he began to hum a tune. A smile whispering across his face he started walking back to his hotel. I was a stranger in the city Out of town were the people I knew feeling of self-pity what to do what to do what to do the outlook was decidedly blue but as I walked through the foggy streets alone it turned out to be the luckiest day I've known a foggy day in London town had me low and had me down I viewed the morning with such a love the British Museum had lost its charm how long I wondered could this thing last but the age of miracles had passed for suddenly I saw you there and through foggy London town the sun was shining everywhere
London town Had me low Had me down I view the morning With such a love The British Museum Had lost its charm How long I wonder Could this thing last But the age of miracles Had passed For suddenly I saw you there And through foggy London town The sun was shining Upside down And begrudgingly, I'll try and conclude with an academic paper. In the early 1990s, Edward Said walked into the lobby of a hotel in London and bumped into the conductor and pianist Daniel Barenboim. Palestinian and Israeli, we needed one from each side to make it work, said Barenboim after Said had died in 2003 after a long fight with leukemia. The highly charged friendship that developed from this chance meeting gave birth to many things, and it is perhaps a sign of the disappointments and disasters that framed their time with each other that much of their friendship was lived out in passionate and intellectually charged conversation, some of which having been published. After all, as I suggested when I was still in costume, intellectual activity is perhaps best resorted to only as a last resort. Born of desperation, it can grow strong and disciplined like burnished gold. At a particularly difficult time in my life, I passed a bar once and saw intellect drinking pints of imagination with art. Art, poor dear, had fallen off her perch and mumbling around on the ground was asking everyone for a kiss. Intellect was sober as a judge, but then only yesterday I bumped into intellect in Starbucks where she was drinking, of all things, a decaf soy latte. You should have heard the crap she was talking. Quite an imagination she's developed since she got that pay rise. Not a drop of booze in sight, and now she seems as drunk as a skunk as if the revolution were happening on her doorstep. It makes one wonder, how does one keep one's focus as one gets old? I told her, you should never have come home, dear. You've lost all your spunk since you came back from being abroad. And do you know what she said? Do you know what she said? She started crying. I just wanted to be loved. Now, what on earth is one meant to say to that? So embarrassing. I, of course, opted for one of mother's lines and said, well, want, want must not be your master. <clears throat> In the early 1990s, the Palestinian intellectual Edward Said walked into the lobby of a hotel in London and bumped into the Jewish conductor and pianist Daniel Barenboim. The highly charged friendship that developed from this chance meeting gave birth to many things. And it is perhaps a sign of the catastrophes and disappointments that, Said at, that, that framed Said at this time that it was with a musician that he developed his most central friendship during the last 10 years of his life. Said, of course, was a highly accomplished musician, and music had always been an important theme in the ongoing counterpoint of his interests. Indeed, it might be worth noting what an awfully large amount of interests he had. I mean, how did he manage to keep all of those things going without losing fakers? I confess, I sometimes thought the poor dear might not in fact be suffering from a rather chronic case of greediness. Literature, political activism, journalism, music, criticism, quite a clever dicky, our Edward, but a bit of a show-off too. No surprise that he hooked up with Daniel then, you know? <sighs> But to give credit where credit's due, I think Daniel had a really nice effect on our Edward. I really do. I mean, they set up that lovely orchestra together, the West Eastern Divan Orchestra, you know, from Middle Eastern kids to play with each other. Ed said it was the most important project of, in his, of his life. But there again, what else could he say? All that politics stuff had, all, had fallen awfully flat on its face. He never got over what he thought was the terrible betrayal of the Oslo Accords. And the less said about the falling out with the old Yasser, the better. I took him out for a drink and I said to him, Edward, Edward, I said. <clears throat> if you can't live in politics, then you might as well live in music. And do you know what he said? Do you know? Well, if you don't know, 
when that makes two of us love. You'll excuse my friends, but I got absolutely shit-faced. Never been so drunk in my life. Ed, he never spoke to me again. Apparently, I was crawling around on the floor asking everyone for a kiss. What are you meant to do with that, eh? Well, even at the best of times, I could never really stand up straight. Always had too much of a taste for gravity. I'm much happier lying on the ground. Well, Ed couldn't stand that. He was far too into standing up. Sometimes I thought his whole life was a great big revenge on the inevitability of the coming fall. I mean, talk about missing your vacation in life. He would have been much better off as a tightrope walker. Although, having said that, shiny leotards weren't really for him, and I should know, you know. Well, anyway, that's another story, love. Anyway, so Ed comes into this hotel in London, what, you know, uh, in the early 1990s, love. So he comes into this hotel in London, lovely hotel. I mean, lovely, beautiful. I mean, make you weep, it would. All right for some, you know. So he comes in, and who do you think is sitting there but Dan fucking Barenboim? Can you believe it? There's Edward, all by himself, humming a tune, loving music, and there's Daniel, all by himself, humming a tune, and he's loving music too. Now, the rest, of course, is history. But one thing that nobody knows, I mean, nobody. When I went out for a drink with Ed, he made me promise not to tell anyone. So you never guess what? Never. Not in a year of Sunday. So it turns out Edward was pregnant. No joke. Bun in the oven, the whole nine yards. And do you know who the father was? Do you? Janae. Yep. Jean fucking Janae. 20 years earlier in Beirut, Janae, hanging out in the Middle East, as it was his one, pops round to visit Ed, who's there on sabbatical, and without Edward even noticing, wham, bam, thank you, Sam, and Edward's up the duff. 20 years he's pregnant, 20 years. I mean, Jesus, I was only pregnant for nine months with that poem. It nearly killed me. Ed's pregnant for 20 years, doesn't even skip a beat. Well, why would he? He didn't have to give birth to the little brat. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Ed didn't give birth. Daniel did that. I kid you not. Edward was pregnant, but Daniel gave birth. Janae, bless his little cotton socks, would have loved it. I mean, he, I always thought he would have liked to have had some kids of his own anyway. And then to have had them by means of such frankly delicious perversion, well, it would have made sense of his life, wouldn't it? I mean, Milan Kundera, in the unbearable lightness of being, well, he said that our lives are less contingency than formally organized like music, according to the laws of beauty. So if indeed... The theme of perverse birth is, as I would argue, an important leitmotif in Janae's work, then it is part of the paradoxical productivity of him as an author that one of those themes continues to sound even though Janae himself has does died. Perhaps, in fact, we might be so bold to assert that what is given birth in the world by Janae's incendiary and hieratic writing is the possibility of an immortal music. I mean, Janae himself says as much in the frankly remarkable passage in Captive Amoureux, which he completed just before his death in 1986. It states, I wrote that though I shall die nothing else will. And I must make my meaning clear. Wonder at the sight of a cornflower, at a rock, at the touch of a rough hand, all the millions of emotions of which I made. They won't disappear, even though I shall. Other men will experience them, and they'll still be there because of them. More and more, I believe, I exist in order to be the terrain and proof which show other men that life consists in the uninterrupted emotions throw, flowing through all creation. The happiness my hand knows in a boy's hair will be known by another hand, is already known. And although I shall die, that happiness will live on. I may die, but what made that I possible, what made possible the joy of being will make the joy of being live on without me. And so if Daniel Barenboim gave birth to the baby that Edward Said had been made pregnant with by Jean Genet, then that is merely because Genet had already experienced giving birth to this baby himself. And if Genet gave birth to this baby, that is because Genet himself was once this baby that was birthed. And since Genet was an orphan, our lineage here is a lineage of orphans, of those too often destined to fall to the stony ground and to wither and die. And so if I desire to make your ear erect, that is so it might fertilize these seeds, that we might reap the proper harvest and feast upon the food that some of us need. In my fantasy, Genet's orphan is an essay the Tightrope Walker. It was first published in 1958. If we are retaining fidelity to the idea of searching and striving and attempting that haunts the word essay in its various language, then an essay it is. It aims at keeping its balance amidst a potentially hostile environment of stylistic forces. 
Its rhetorical muscles are the leanest form of steel, for to keep us suspended in our belief that the sickness it preaches is to the benefit of our health, they must propel us across wide voids with effortless grace. Such an essay can only be an orphan, for it is only from the encounter with the unquestionable reality of an unfathomable sadness that the need necessary for the production of such a discipline can arise. The disturbingly high degree of pleasure to be gained from our writing is but the prize we receive when the world leaves us numb or twitches us to spastic wince. The world must, on some level, have profoundly failed the essay in order for the essay to be born. The essay is born of this failure. Failure is its parent. Its parent fails, and so an orphan it is. It is from such contortions that wonderment is born. If essays are orphans, then universities are sometimes orphanages. But if they might sometimes like to think of themselves as places of shelter for the circus writing that must perform without a safety net, they are, like all institutions, also places of the law, and so more than capable of child abuse. Our hallowed halls are monitored not by essays, but by articles. And the word article, we should remember, is at times a term of law. In order to perform their tricks, essays must be light. This is why they are frequently orphans who are angular and lithe from lack of food and a life lived constantly in dashing away from the scenes of their own petty crimes. The article, by comparison, must be fat from gorging at its feast of content. The buttons of its style must be fit for bursting from the pressure exerted upon them by the swelling footnotes beneath. If they are heavy enough not to fly, articles are deemed to be reliable, good, honest guys with their feet firmly planted in the ground. And as such, they can weigh a curriculum vitae down enough that a university, to save itself from the shame of seeming to be unbalanced, must stock up the other side of the scales with the appropriate rises in salary. Essays are the provenance of the aristocracy or those made hedonistic by the realization that they are never going to get home. And so in our own day and age, when the intellectual functions need account for their every moment with a stopwatch, essays are easily seen as traitors of our securities. And so to stop them getting fat, it is perhaps best to take them out of the academy altogether for fear also of what undocumented acts of revenge might be wreaked upon them there in secret. So if Genet's essay, The Typewrote Artist, is indeed an essay, and so an orphan potentially in our care, it is true to say that it is also something much more raw, which has not yet been allowed into the kitchen to be properly cooked. It is a manual of techniques in the form of a prose poem, a logical treatise on the strategic art of hygienic solitude, an intoxicating draft so strong it would at last make us sober a shaman's rattle to make the inanimate things like pieces of wire sing, a recipe for death that will cure us of our melancholia, a musical improvisation on a set of circling themes under constant revision, a reflection of a narcissism without mirrors, and perhaps most importantly of all, a love letter to Genet's boyfriend at the time, Abdullah Bentaga. A love letter, and yet one that barely concerns Abdullah as an individual at all. A cheap style of psychoanalytic criticism might say that it's all a fantasy projection of Genet's own desired image of himself, and indeed, there is much truth to that. At a certain point in the essay, Genet argues that every man has a wound where he takes refuge, a home where he will gain the necessary strength for the development of his art. For the tightrope walker of whom I speak, he writes, it is visible in his sad gaze which has to reflect images of an unforgettably wretched childhood in which he knew he was abandoned. It is a description frequently made of Genet by others. In fact, Abdullah was not an orphan. His father, an Algerian acrobat, had died when Abdullah was a child, but his German mother still lived. He nevertheless did live in a certain displacement within the already displaced world of the circus, in a kind of mini exile in a separate tent with a Moroccan friend, Ahmed. Since childhood, he had trained as a juggler and an acrobat. With what can only now appear as pitifully ironic, one of his fellow circus performers remarked that he was a real ground technician. Genet, of course, wanted him to be otherwise and so started paying for him to have lessons to become a tightrope walker. 
He also convinced him to desert from conscription so as not to have to fight against his own people in the Algerian war. This forced them into a kind of wandering exile back and forth across Europe, Genet increasingly acting as his trainer. Abdullah was eventually taken up by the Italian Orfei Circus for a tour of Kuwait, performing the routine that Genet had developed for him. And whilst there, he had an accident that made it impossible for him ever to perform again. Genet tried to look after him and provide finances, but his own attentions had turned to someone else, Jackie Maglia, whom he was now concentrating his efforts on turning into a successful racing car driver. Abdullah, falling and falling into deeper realms of depression, eventually landed at the bottom and committed suicide. Genet paid for his grave to be kept up for 22 years, but never remembered to renew the plot for any longer. The very day that Genet was buried, in 1986, in Morocco, Abdullah's bones were dug up in Paris and tossed into the common grave. Like so many famous male homosexual artists from this period, Genet had a disastrous effect on those who tried to sustain romantic relations with him. Similar horror stories are rife in those surrounding Rainer Fassbinder, Joe Alton, Francis Bacon, for example. The fact that interest in such tales easily verges on turning sacrifice into a spectator sport should not, however, convince us that by turning away, we are therefore acting more responsibly. Turning away gives us more ethical space, for sure but it also makes us flaccid from the comforts attendant on having put ourselves on the side of the angels. There is a place where we might stand in these tales, but it is as thin and precarious as a wire strung high up above the ground. And so to stand there, we might benefit from some of Genet's advice in his essay. Out of respect for Abdullah in the face of Genet, we too must become Abdullah trying to please Genet. The equation that Genet gives us is a simple one. To make our aesthetic performance succeed, we have to make ourselves dead within the world outside of its focused frame. As we pass from non-aesthetic into aesthetic life, we must pass through a shock in which we are transformed from a kind of stinking objection, according to Genet, into a magnificent monster. Off stage, our clothes are rags, we fail to wash, our relations with others flail with their asthmatic shortness of breath. Nothing possesses the vigor or self-indifference that is capable of attaining form. On stage, though, we are a pure, focused intensity. And from that, we attain the dignity that only can be obtained from the performing of something difficult, merely for the sake of performing it. Only when our end is in our beginning can we then disappear. Only there and then are we redeemed. Only when we have honed the skill of forgetting can we then, with responsibility, begin to remember. When Genet met Abdallah, his inspiration as a writer was starting to desert him. At this time, Genet becomes incapable of bringing anything to completion. And the import of this, um, and the import for him in being able to do so, is brought clearly to our attention if we remember that he was more than prepared to be repeatedly put into prison, for only there he claimed could he write his novels properly. Only there could he get what he wanted. Genet was now lost, and Abdullah was something of a lost soul too, dreaming of homes he'd never been in a position to inhabit. So Genet, with the profound love that misguides every good parent I have ever met, tried to give Abdullah the very thing he could no longer give to himself. And Genet failed. The orphan killed his own imagined orphaned child. And in a sense... Genet never forgave himself. He puts down his pen and starts his wanderings into the east with the Palestinians, where he momentarily meets Edward Said, and into the west with the Black Panthers, where Edward Said momentarily stands mesmerized watching Genet give a talk at a political rally on the steps of Low Library at Columbia University in New York. If you can't live in art, then maybe live in politics. Genet's final masterpiece, Captive Amoureux, published just before his death, is the wandering poetic testament to the necessity of this decision in his life. For Edward Said, if you can't live in pro politics properly anymore, then perhaps you should live in art. And his final posthumous masterpiece on late style, in which there is a moving essay on Genet, is as close as he ever came to this confession. Genet and Said met at a crossroads called Beirut. They were slowly passing each other in opposite directions. And so, as I wander back to the green room, note the small child 
pottering about meaning meaninglessly on stage. Its father, Daniel Barenboim, is busy with other things, saving the world through music, taunting the Israeli government, formulating a global politics from out of an active meditation on Beethoven's heroic styles, all sorts of grand, impressive, and sometimes, frankly, rather bloated endeavors. The child has a very dull name, the phenomenology of sound. In the way of all mythologies, she dropped out of her father's mouth during a conversation he was in fact having with Edward Said. This is the cry she made as she came into the world. This is the phenomenology of sound. The fact that sound is ephemeral, that sound has a very concrete relation to silence. I often compare it to the law of gravity. In the same way that objects are drawn to the ground, so are sounds drawn to silence and vice versa. And if you accept that, then you have a whole dimension of physical inevitabilities, which as a musician, you try to defy. The art of making music through sound is, for me, the art of illusion. And indeed, ladies and gentlemen, this is now the end of the show. Thank you very much. <laughs>